We shall begin the session with praying in tongues. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you with all our heart for this new day, for this new opportunity to come and see you, to come and hear you, to come and stay under your grace. Jesus Christ, we thank you, we glorify you, we magnify you, because you are not just our Redeemer, our Savior. You did not just volunteer to take all our sacrifices, but even when you left, you promised you wouldn't leave us alone. You wouldn't leave us until the end of time. You promised you will send us your Holy Spirit who will keep edifying us edifying in this body of Christ all together so that we can support each other into this sanctification, coming together each day, giving all that we have, putting all our members, sacrificing everything that we have to put it at the service of our Lord so that we, so that we can come close to you every day, so that we can experience heaven on earth so that we can have this love that you're giving us and pass it into others. This love that you're giving us is not meant to be kept in secret. That is for us to go on the rooftops and declare that you have made us a new creature and that this is the light, the light of the world that cannot be hidden under a table. It cannot be hidden. It is to be used to bring this light where there is darkness. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have already taken control of this session. We thank you for all the miracles you have performed. When your word goes and take every test to a testimony, when your word goes and destroys the demon of unbelief, the spirit of unbelief, when your word goes and teaches us what to say, when your word comes to us and give us the revelation, giving us the experience of having the word becoming flesh in ourselves. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for because you have made this beautiful teaching already simple and easy to understand through the mouth of our Papa, our beloved Brother Johnson. We thank you because of all the hearts that are listening right now have already come committed committed to study the word of law, the word of God with all their love. And it's not just because of fear. It's not because it's demanded from them, but it is because it has become the new way of life for each one of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. So can we go again, Sister uh, Marina, to yes. sit on of Corinthians 5.21? Yes, yes. It's good if we revise, you know, every day what we learned the previous day, even if it's for a short while.
Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Papa was explaining to us yesterday, completing uh, the three persons in this interaction of Second of Corinthians 5.21. So in Second of Corinthians, we see that he said, for he had made him to be seen for us. So that right on that line, we see that there are three names or three different persons. For he is our Lord, God the Father is the first person in this interaction and had made him and him is God the son had made him to be seen and he was made to be seen for us and who is that us so papa took the time yesterday to explain who is that us in that part of the scripture and he says that us is the third person who is the sinner so the third person is you and me each one of us is called now to reflect to reflect and ask ourselves how much have i gone away have i gone astray from our lord from our creator and that's what is what we're describing today as well that when we have that hardness of the heart that unbelief on the power and the grace and the mercy of our lord is when we go away from him because we ourselves wants to believe that we can make it into this life with no with no god so we make ourselves to be a, a god himself so that's when we go away from him but papa says god is never away from me it's me who goes away from god is me is us who are a rebel and he said something really important here that it caught my attention because he says, we are rebels even though we have been born again. So we're not talking about just the past before I was born again, but even being born again, we still can fall as we just said, we still can, if we want to go away from God, we still still can fall into rebelliousness. So we are rebels, he says, even though we have been born again, even though we have been given the Holy Spirit to make a life of righteousness, to live in a life of righteousness. And he started to describe this, this person, this third person saying that here is a man who has known who doesn't know Jesus at all. And probably it's not only that he has not heard about Jesus, but when we when we say that he has no Jesus, he does not does not know Jesus at all. Remember that Papa is talking to us about now experiencing Jesus in an intimacy relationship. Like what he's explained to us today, you cannot experience that Jesus died for you if you don't know if you are not willing to believe that Jesus loves you, if you are not willing to believe that Jesus gave his life for you, then you don't believe and you you don't know Jesus. And that's what Papa is saying here, is saying that a person who does not know Jesus at all, and he is just carried by the sinful nature, and he's just committing scene after scene he's living a, a a life with has that has no inheritance in the kingdom of heaven and that's what the bible says the bible says that such a person who is lost in sin has no inheritance in the kingdom of heaven so papa described how is it that this person when he's disconnected from Jesus, when he's just lost in sinful life, he's standing alone in court. Just as we were saying today, if you do not believe in what Jesus did for you, then you're standing alone in, alone in front of the Lord. And Papa said to yesterday, he's standing in the court, in the court where God is the judge, and we know that there is no hope for us when we're standing alone. 
because we know we have been taking sometimes even God's name in vain, but also that we have been using our body as a source of entertainment to receive pleasure, the pleasure that comes from from being a sinner, the pleasure that comes from the world, the pressure that is offered by the devil. And we use, we offer our bodies as a member to fall into this, into this sinful life. So when the moment comes and we go into the court and God is the judge and there are names that are going to be called and when those names are called into court, the name of the sin, the sin, the sinner, is also called, and he's not to appear. And everyone starts to ask, "Where is he? Where is he?" And then at the end, really low, we hear a voice that comes really low, and with tears and deep sobbing, saying, "I am here." So when you're lost when you're disconnected, when you do not believe in Jesus, when you are just waiting for the last minute and you go into that God judgment, the date of the judgment, that's what happens. You go in there with tears and deep sobbing, saying, I am here because there is no escape. Every one of us is going to be judged, but also because we know and we know that without Jesus, there is no hope. You're going to be judged and you're in your way to hell. So Papa gave us the example of the woman who was caught in adultery. He didn't, he, he did not give us the scripture, but I, I look at it and that's John 8. So the woman was caught in adultery. And according to the law, she is to be stoned to death. So there is no hope. Just as, as we had said before, the date of the judgment come. And she has been caught in sin. So there's no hope for her. But Jesus is the only hope for each one of us. Jesus is the shepherd for the lost sheep. And the men who brought her are coming all to accuse her. And she's standing there alone and trembling. Just as we say that we hear that voice of the one who is in court alone. So she's alone and trembling and she is not daring to open her mouth and say a word because she knows she knows that she is being caught in sin. She's alone, said that Papa yesterday. We know that if someone is caught into adultery, usually there have to be two of them. But she's brought alone and she's brought in front of Jesus and the men start asking Jesus, what should we do with her? The law says that she must be punished. So they're asking him for his point of view. They're tempting him to see if he goes against the law. So if he says, let her go, he goes against the law. And if he instructs them to treat her according to the law, then he is teaching them unforgiveness. But Jesus, with all his mercy and wisdom, not wanting to teach no one to break the law and not wanting to teach no one to practice unforgiveness, says, yes, surely she must be punished. But let the one who has never committed sin cast the first stone. So one by one, starting by the elders, they started leaving and she was left alone. When she's left alone, then Jesus says, where are those who came to condemn you? And she said to, to Jesus, they all left. And the only person there who can commit, condemn her was Jesus, because he is the only one who has committed no sin. But he says to her, he takes the decision to teach her and says, neither do I condemn you. And he gives her a beautiful instruction. Go and sin no more. And Papa explained to us yesterday that this part of the scripture says, go and leave 
a life, a new life, a life of righteousness that you will walk in sin no more. So this is connected beautifully to today's teaching when we're asking ourselves, then will I go back to sin? When you have been given this beautiful new opportunity, when Jesus is telling us, now go and live into this newness of life. Walk in sin no more. So Papa is asking us to have the power of visualization and get into her shoes and say, look at this situation, imagine her situation. Her heart is palpitating so fast. The devil is accusing her of sin. The punishment, the wrath must come in onto her. And now the question is in her mind is like, how can I ever get delivered from this position? She's so scared she cannot even open her mouth. And this is what God is telling us, that we were born from sin. We were born with that seed of sin that we inherited from Adam. And that's why we're born as a rebel, we're born into the world as a sinner. But we have, and that gives us the power to rebel against God. So the power to rebel against God is injected into us to say no to God and say yes to the devil. And it's because of this that we committed more and more sin and we break the commandments of our Lord. We, because that sin has been injected into us, that nature to rebel against our Lord, we reject God's love. So now that we're in the place of the judgment where God is, is going to declare us guilty, he says that he demands justice for the crime and the penalty has to be paid, but he let her go. And the Lord is saying to us this morning that even though we were destined to hell, a divine exchange took place. A divine exchange that we're seeing there in 2nd of Corinthians uh, 5, verse 25, 21. And the divine exchange is that God, see you and me, and he made us righteous, and he made Jesus to pay for our sin. And that's the, divine, the, the great divine exchange that takes care of it takes place here. We had no choice. We had no hope. But Jesus took our place. And that's when Papa was saying that we were on the court trial box. The father was the judge. Jesus is the advocate now. And the third person is the prisoner. So we're standing in that court trial box. And God has called you and me in his presence. And this trial is to determine if we are to die or if we have to leave, if we are to leave. This judgment is for eternity. We're not talking about present life, but for eternity. And when we look at what we have done, there is no hope. Just like that woman who was caught in adultery. We know that the, the proof against us is so big but God is gracious and he is the one who decides to save us because he loves us he loves us but at the same time he's a just God he cannot let go the crime without being unpunished he must punish it because if he lets go there is no punish there will be injustice so the same case that Jesus said before, yes, she must be punished, but I'll give you one, one requirement that is the one who is with no sin, the one that can cast a stone on her. So he didn't teach that sin can go unpunished. He didn't teach unjustice. 
So we as a sinner that are in the court box, we can visualize that sinner. And the sinner is in that situation is just seeing the future as he's lost, he's being condemned to go to hell. And he's feeling guilty and he's guilty. That feeling of guiltiness is the one that's taking him away from heaven. And now he is destined to go to hell where he will be continuously tormented and tortured, tortured for eternity. So as we see this, Papa says there are two attributes that seems to be conflicting that are going on in God's mind. That he is a loving God, that he is a just God, but he must punish sin. He must destroy sin. So who can do it? Who can do that if he, the Father, lets go free the sinner? He's not a just judge. And here's what the Father came with this new way that knew, no one knew is the mystery that God had planned even before the foundation of this earth to save you and me, to save each one of us. That we're standing in that box as a guilty and we cannot even speak, just as, as the woman who was caught in adultery. She couldn't even speak. She was trembling. She knows. She knows the, the end. And when the person declares that he's guilty, there is no more hope. And even if you dare to declare that, that you are not guilty when you're standing in that trial box, you know that the evidence is so big that it won't help you. Because God has been recording all my iniquities so there is no way i can escape so the prisoner as a prisoner as a sinner we know that we are sure that we're being found guilty so how can i escape the same question that that woman have how can i ever get delivered from this and papa reminded us in this world we see that based on the human law the greatest criminals can escape and the simplest ones are punished, but not on the eyes of the law of God. Because God himself is the judge. And he's saying, you have sinned, you're a sinner, I must punish you. But it's God's love that says, I love you, I want to save you. I want to spare the sinner. Not the sin, but the sinner. So this is what... It, these are the attributes that seems to be conflicted in the mind of God. He loves us, but he is a just God. So he takes the son who is pure and perfect. And he used the son, replaces us. He is, like he put the son now in that trial box. And he accounted his son to be guilty for us. So now is the son, the son who give us his righteousness, and we give him our sin. And this is the wonderful mystery that the Lord had made a new way for us. And that's why Jesus, when he came, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. Because through Jesus, our Father, made this way that was never in there, but was with all the plan and intention of our Lord, our Lord Father to save us. And is now an innocent who is dying in place of the guilty. Christ, who was spotless, is dying for the sinners. And if you look from the outside, as we've seen today as well with the teaching, it looks like unbelievable, sometimes even looks as, as in injustice that the sinner goes free and the one who is pure pays and goes to death. The justice of the punishment has been done when the Father substitutes us with, with Jesus. And now the sinner is no longer a sinner because he stands in Christ's place. And that's what we will be teaching today as well with the baptism. If we stand in Christ, 
then we're no longer sinners. We are now covered with the garment of righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that's why we have been accepted in the eyes of our Creator. And it's Christ who takes our place. And it seems to be unjust. But this is purely voluntarily on the side of Christ. No one is forcing him. Christ was ready to stand in our place. Ready to drink the cup of our punishment. Which he did. And he is more than willing to do it. So is this substitution of God unlawful? And Papa said, I will show you in two different places that the Bible says it's not, unlawful, it's not unlawful because in the Old Testament, we see that when a man committed sin, God provided a sacrifice which represented Christ. Christ was not there by then. But the sacrifice represented Christ because that animal who was sacrificed and was pure died for the sinner. And then Papa also said that the first example where we saw this is the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve had fallen into sin, they covered themselves with, with fig leaves. And, pa and Papa explained to us that then God made the first sacrifice to cover them with an animal skin. We do not know what kind of animal, but we do know that there is no way you can use an animal skin without killing the animal. So Papa will say, said that the animal might have said, but I'm innocent. I've done no crime. They are the ones who are guilty. And God will reply, yes. And that's exactly what I want from you. Your innocence. And that's why this sacrifice in the Old Testament is representing Christ because Christ was innocent. So God says to the animal, I want your innocence to cover them with your innocence. And an innocent was put to death as a sacrifice dying for the sinner. As the sacrifice died instead of the sinner, the same way that the animal was put to death for Adam and Eve. And the sacrifice continues because the law says that anyone who committed sin had to bring an animal. So they bring a sheep before the altar and they put their hand, the sinner puts their hand on the head of the animal. They confess their sin, they acknowledge their, th their sin. And when they do that, their sins get transferred into the animal. And once that the sin has been confessed and transferred into the animal, now the animal is slaughtered and cast out as a sin offering. And that is how every sinner must do with Christ. If he is to be saved, a sinner by faith comes and puts his head his hands in the head of Christ and confess all his sins and then our sins are transferring to Jesus Christ. So when Job, John the Baptist was baptizing Christ, he says, you are the one who should baptize me, but Christ was clear of his, his mission. So when John comes and he puts his hands on the head of Jesus. Jesus is accepting that he is becoming the scapegoat in our place. He's ready to die in our place, just as, as that animal that was being used and the sinner will put his hand on the head and confess the sins. So when John the Baptist is putting his hand on Jesus' head, Jesus is saying, I am ready to take the sin of the whole world. I am ready to die in their place. And that is when Jesus' mission begins. And he was hung upon the tree and he endures all the shame. And now Jesus, that took us, the sinners, all the, the, the sin, even though he was naked for us, he was made sin, he suffered a painful death. He did it. He became our scapegoat because now he has declared his people to be the bride 
in the New Testament now, we are called the bride. The people of God is called the bride. So Papa here explains, gave another example of how is that Jesus redeemed us. And he says that according to the law, when a woman has many debts, when she gets married, this debt is transferred into her husband. Just as the sin is transferred into the scapegoat, the debt of a woman is transferred into her husband. So if a woman was charged with debt, and she is in fear of prison or being stoned, stoned to death. Once that she stretches her hands and become a wife, let herself to be rescued by a man, there is no one in the world who can touch her again because now the husband is liable for all her debts. So this is what Jesus did. He takes us as, our, as the bride, and now we're presented to the Lord as the bride spotless he is taking our debts and she now the bride is saying to the creditors i owe you nothing you have no more right on, on upon me you have no more right but these debts are transferred into the husband this is the other example of how papa presented us what is that jesus did for us because Christ is the one who is paying for our debt. Now, we are to understand the love that the Lord has for us. Because the woman was supposed to be under God's vengeance. She was supposed to suffer for that justice treatment. But Christ says... You are my wife, I'm the one who chose you, and I am the one who pays your debts. And that's what Christ is saying to us. The same thing that was now explained to baptism. If we accept him, and if we choose to believe in what he did for us, he is paying for our debts. So Christ is saying, you are my wife, you are the one who I choose you, I am the one who pays your debts. And this husband, who is Christ, had paid now all, all our fault. And now God is pleased. The, the case is closed. We are discharged. And Papa said here again, the same thing that he's saying about baptism. And now whosoever believes in Christ and confess that has peace with God. Because the justicements of peace is in Christ because God made Christ sin for us who knew no sin so God had already made had already made it and if we believe it and we confess it now we're made into the righteousness of God now we don't have that debt we're no longer the woman with debt we're no longer the man standing alone in that trial box we're no longer the woman who was caught into into adultery but christ has taken all of that for us there is a little bit more of the of the review sister you want me to keep going and i'm aware of the of the that retreat is going on as well and those are the three examples papa gave uh, if if you have uh, just five minutes to go it's okay because you know this will be recorded you know if we don't do the recap it will never be there in this video Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, let me just go. So Papa was explaining us yesterday that the salvation only takes place if we really believe that God made His Son to be to to be accounted for our sinners. If we do not believe her, then we do not receive that salvation. Because man in his falling stage does not deserve anything good from God. But Jesus is representing man. And is the father who has envisioned this. Jesus is being perfect and he is willing to go through all of this. 
so you can see how Jesus was grown into a manhood, but you can also see him going into grief and sorrow. But he is in grief and sorrow because he is following, he's being obedient, but he's still doing it because he believes on that justice that has to be taking place so that we are safe. So Papa was saying, why did Jesus accept this sorrow and pain? And he says, he must have to. Jesus must have to accept it because he has to be the substitute. And that is what the book of Isaiah speaks about, a man of sorrow. Jesus went into grief and sorrow. He knew what he was going to go through, but he must accept it. And that's what the book of Isaiah speaks about, the man of sorrow. A person that is pure and is peaceful, but he has been made impure by taking our sins, the people's sins, the whole world. So now the guilt is imputed into him. The very guilt of the whole humanity is imputed into Jesus, and that's what brings grief. Even the death that came into Jesus was not a normal death. It was an unusual death. It was full of horror. Everyone was making fun of him, the prince of darkness, and those who were accusing him. They stood in front of him and they dared him saying, if you are the, the son of the Lord, why don't you save yourself? They were tormenting him. They were making him suffer. They were oppressing him. And all the started said Papa yesterday when he decided to walk into to Jerusalem in the Garden of Gethsemane, this spiritual war was going on. And that's why under that amount of oppression, he started bleeding. The Son of God was spit upon. He was being tormented, oppressed, insulted. He was kicked. His clothes were taken away. He was nailed. He was being to wear a crown of, of thorns. Everyone was mocking him. He was put to shame. When he was thirsting for water, he was given vinegar. When he was crying out to God, he looked up and he said, why have you forsaken me? How can this be happening? And this only happens because justice is perfect. The Lord is just. He cannot let sin to be unpunished. So he is taking the pure and the holy to suffer for us. And we can again ask today, but why this did happen? Why is the Lord allowing this? Why are, why are you God not stopping all this suffering? How can you allow such a torment into the innocent? And he's explained to us again, it's because God is just. There must be justice. There must be justice. The answer comes from the judge. And he says to us today, be still. Be still, even though you're seeing the suffering of the innocent, because he knew that at the end, the result was going to be completely different. And as the song that we always, the praise and worship song that we, be, we hear, be still I know that I am God. The sinner guilt is in Jesus, and that's why this is justice. But the son has agreed to go through that, has agreed he knows he should be, he must be punished. He knows he should die. He knows he's going to be uncomfortable with no honor, nothing to hold in. And this is the great, great exchange that took place, that Christ made the way that our Lord made for us. 
and Papa then asked yesterday, just the same question that Sister Marina and Sister Christina were saying right now. So how does this act of Jesus Christ affect each one of us today? And Papa says, how can the sinner being full of sin, knowing that you have brought the course of the law, how can you break every rule and all the ordinances of God and then being free we see in the earth that the sinners might escape that the, the sinners might escape to the law but not in the eyes of god and now when we are saved by jesus christ we do see that the same sinner by accepting this grace and this savior by our lord now we're coming today as we the three of us declare and we're preaching the gospel of christ so this is the effect this is the effect of what jesus did for us even today by believing with our spiritual eyes what he did the same one who went a sinner before and had no hope to be saved when our lives are transformed now we want to come and pre preach the gospel now we're ambassadors preaching to those who are lost and we're telling them and even today we're telling to ourselves so that we can start getting more understanding christ is our substitute so now you can see the same person who had a stony heart whose heart was broken and now is slowly pursuing his way to heaven you can see that very same person who had a broken heart, a hardened heart that is being converted. And he is he now who is believing that there is a way to heaven and he wants to bring the others with you. How can now we pretend that we're going to go back to sin instead of going to heaven? we as a corrupted man deserve to be punished because we were lost we were completely lost in the desires of the world but it's christ who took our place and he's saying i am taking your own righteousness and you are receiving my righteousness and now we have to understand that this is the effect of what Christ this did for us. Even today, we just said it a couple of minutes ago. How is it that this happened 20 to 20,000 years ago and we still get to experience it? Praise the 2000. Lord. 2000. 2000. Yeah, 2000 years ago, 2022, if we want to be more. So maybe the exchange didn't take place right today, but surely we can experience his life. We can experience this newness of lives. We can experience that how when we were dead in our sins, he is the only one, the chosen one, who has been able to clear our debts. And now we are presented clean in front of the fathers. And this is only made because now he has chosen us to be an ambassador, to go and preach the truth, the truth that the sinner can repent, that the sinner came half a way to go to heaven if we believe in the work of Jesus. Now there is no condemnation only because we believe in Christ, only for the ones who are walking for Christ and we are no longer walking after the flesh, but after the spirit. And Papa closed the, the, the teaching say, thank you, Lord, for this great miracle, for this divine exchange. So if you ask today, how is that, that what the Lord did for us 2,000 years ago can still affect us is because it's a great miracle. It's the way that our Lord decided to save 
all humankind is a divine exchange. And we are to meditate on this day and night, meditate on this so that we can receive the understanding and the revelation that we were on our way to hell and now hell was canceled and we are in our way to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Doctor. This for that wonderful weekend. Thank you. Praise God. Let's go Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 